throne of grace for such a time as this. Now, here's your host, Johnette Bankovic. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic. Always a pleasure, a joy to be with you. I consider it a great privilege and honor that we have this time to spend together to have holy conversation. And as you know, we always invite you to be with us Monday through Saturday at the same time on this same station. If you're out there on social media, you'd be sure to join us there as well as we continue to make our way into the abundant life that our Lord Jesus Christ intends for us to know, intends for us to experience experience. It's always a joy to have that kind of a conversation. And it's always a joy for you to go out to our website, womenofgrace.com. We certainly do invite you to go out there. All kinds of good resources are available for you there. Certainly do want to remind you about our subscribership program. Uh, When you become a subscriber to Women of Grace Exclusive, all of our archives open up to you. All of the uh, various uh, different programs that we've got available for you on television, on radio, special presentations are there for you. All of our retreat conferences, Uh, those talks are there. You can actually make a mini retreat at home. So I invite you to get out there to womenofgrace.com, see what's happening, see where I'm going to be next, see where in the world is John at Bankovic this weekend. So we certainly do invite you to get out there. Well, I'll tell you where I am right now. I am right here on the campus of EWTN in Irondale, Alabama, right on these very grounds where Mother Angelica began this great outreach of evangelization raised up by the Holy Spirit for such a time as this. And I have a very special guest here in studio with me today, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to introduce to my uh, listeners today, my viewers out there on social media, Jack Williams, who is the general manager of EWTN Radio. You hear him on Open Line Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and he happens to be my fiance. Hi, Jack. Hi, Johnette. How are you? Thank just, you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Well, I, didn't, I didn't know if I would get invited to a show on my own radio network. <laughs> You're always welcome at Women of Grace, Jack. It's always a delight to have you, uh, you know, here and and to talk with us. You've been on television lots of times with me, though. I have been. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know about lots of times. Several times. Yeah. Well, yeah. several several is a good number. And you know, it, it's interesting because we announced to the world that uh, we were engaged uh, back there on December 24th, I believe, and we did it through social media. We got a lot of response, and most recently, I had you on the television program for a simulcast, so lots of our listeners were present for that, as well as our viewers, when we had the opportunity to take out to our broader uh, audience the fact that, that we were getting married, and I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about our journey. What do you think? I, I think it would be fun. You know, um, marriage is under attack. It is. Uh, we talk about that a lot on Open Line. Mm-hmm. We talk about that. I know you talk about that a lot on Women of Grace. I do. And it's it's an undeniable fact in our culture, mm-hmm. you know, from any number of angles. You know, divorce is one thing. You know, the whole gender euf- d- uh, dysphoria and uh, same-sex attraction is a whole another issue completely, but um, it's clearly a key tactic that the evil one is using to attack our society. Yes. And you and I have known that to be the case. We've been in the battle for a while, and we understand that's true. Yes. But when our Lord orchestrates events so as to give you an even clearer anecdotal view of what marriage is supposed to be, it draws an even starker contrast yes. between what it's supposed to be and what's being counterfeited in our culture today. Yeah. Well, you know, the counterfeits are so visible, but the reality of what marriage is meant to be is less visible. And we do see it from time to time. There are those special marriages. I'm thinking that you uh, have in your recollection, uh, dear listener today, dear viewer today, that, that you can call up and you can say, gee, you know, that was a good marriage. Uh, but understanding how that comes about and how that marriage is made and what makes it good is not what is heralded in our day and time today. And I think that it behooves us to talk a little bit about that. So when you Jack, make the statement that you've just made that, you know, the counterfeit uh, we see, but what, what is a good marriage today, and it needs to be protected and coveted in some ways, then what, what are you describing? How should it be? Well, I had the great privilege of having a wonderful, as did you, example of what marriage to a large degree should look like mm-hmm. in growing up with my mother and father. Mm-hmm. 
you know, who have been married for 60 some odd years, I believe I would actually have to tabulate it up, but my, my parents are in their early 80s. They're mm -hmm. still married, uh, living together in their own home <laughs> and, uh, and, and still on a daily basis, as you've experienced mm -hmm. in the household, as you experience in any household, yes. are still working through that marriage on a daily <laughs> basis some, <laughs> some 60 some odd years uh, later. Yeah. But, you know, I think that having that example really set a course for what I would have expected from any marriage long before I took my faith seriously at all, and certainly long before I became a Catholic. Mm -hmm. But I just had a certain assumption of what I thought marriage was, which is another illustration of why it's so very important that the authentic view of marriage be modeled for people to see. Yeah. Because they're going to follow what they see in large degree. Yeah. And that's unfortunately not what they're seeing in our culture. But I had the great privilege of, of witnessing that, and I think I sort of had that filed away as my ideal for what marriage should be mm -hmm. and was just lucky and fortunate enough to have cooperated enough with the Holy Spirit at various times, mm -hmm. I'm convinced, yes, that I was able to actually enter into that life yeah, and have a feel for, for the fruits of it, the benefits of it. And, um, and now I'm going to have the opportunity to perhaps take those things even a little bit deeper. Yeah. Well, and of course, you're referring to your, your marriage with Susie. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are not aware of the fact, Jack is a widower and uh, was married for 20 years and had a wonderful marriage with his wife, Susie. I was married for longer than that to my husband, Anthony. I lost him almost 11 years ago. And um, I think that, you know, there's a certain reality to having had a marriage that you've worked through uh, experiencing all of the highs and, and, and some of the trials that come with married life and learning how to approach those uh, with the mind of the church that lays down, I think, a beautiful foundation for wherever it is that the Lord wants to take you after that point. Some people find themselves in a situation much like ours where, where they're going to be remarried. Others choose a, a path of widowhood uh, that, that lasts the rest of the life. But the fact is, you grow from those circumstances that you experience. You mentioned your mom and dad, you know, married for 60-some years. My parents were married for 68 when my mom passed away a couple of years ago. And as children, you observe and you see. What I always saw was that when mom and dad had... Uh, you know, a disagreement when they had something that, that was difficult, maybe due to circumstances outside of, of their own relationship, uh, th there was a bearing with it, you know? And this, I think, is what's lost so much today. There's, we live in the, the day and the time of no-fault divorce, and people rush uh, to the, the divorce courts uh, before really taking a step back and saying, what is it that God wants to do in me through this trial? Now, there are some situations, of course, where it's unavoidable and there's very little solution. Uh, and that's something that you take up uh, with a priest and, and, and much counseling and, and, and much discernment. But the fact of the matter is today, it's trivialities that often separate people or a sense of falling out of love, you know? And it's not about the romance. That launches it. Uh, but it's really about this decision to love this person through an act of total self-donation that goes on day from day from day. And that's exactly what it is. It's a decision. Right. You know, we treat love as an emotion in our right. culture, and it's right. not. It's a decision. I, I have, uh, from my earliest youth, you know, I have these wonderful, fond, secure memories of always feeling safe at home. Mm-hmm. No matter how, you know, and there were times in my childhood when I felt safer at school based yeah. on my behavior. <laughs> Sometimes I felt safer at home based on my behavior because there were some things that there were some recourses that schools had when I was a youth that they don't necessarily have today. Yes. That sometimes I feared based on <laughs> my behavior in school. But well, and fear is one of the levels of obedience, that, right? That's we exactly often obey right. out of fear before we obey out of love. <laughs> that's exactly right. But I always felt secure I always felt safe and secure at home 
And really reflecting back on that, I think it was largely because I knew that that was always going to be my home. There was all, they were always going to be my parents. Right. You know, them not being married was not an option. Right. We never, they never talked to me about that not being an option for them. They never articulated that to me ever, but I knew it Yeah. all the same. You know, and that was one of the cornerstones. Susie and I did not, from a Catholic perspective, did not exactly start our relationship or our marriage out on just 100% rock-solid Catholic theological footing by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, we entered into that thing knowing that marriage was marriage and divorce was not an option. And everything is navigable when you when you launch from that port. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And, and, and I'm very aware of the fact that uh, you might be listening in this moment and you might be saying, well, you know, I had that idea too. And yet things didn't go the way that I had hoped they would go. Or uh, the person that I married clearly didn't have that same intentionality of heart. And these are tragic situations, right? Um, And so what we do in those tragic situations is to, as I mentioned earlier, discern the will of God as best we can, do what we can to rectify that which needs to be rectified. And oftentimes it's a dying to self in yet another way. We begin to discover that, gee whiz, you know, funny thing, you know, I'm as much of the problem as my spouse is, right? Not so, you, John. No. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> um, but, you know, the fact is that, you know, none of us is perfect. And so this whole business of marriage being a vocation that's meant to lead us into holiness of life, that we might one day attain salvation, it's by its very nature going to offer us opportunities to... Uh, die to self, to be perfected. And we're often perfected through our spouse. That's that's the way God set it up for marriage. You know, that that's part of it. And and yet, you know, today we, we want to duck out of that. But we have to try. We have to see if we can make it work. And it was that way with Anthony and I. We, we were married for 34 years, and we had ups and we had downs in our married life. Um, we had seasons. I, I like to share that with people, especially young people that are getting married. You know, marriage has its seasons. And so there were seasons that were just wonderful. And then there were some seasons that were more difficult where we we struggled. And it was the vow that kept us together because like you and Susie, we just didn't talk about divorce. I think only once divorce was mentioned. And I realized I was part of the problem. Imagine such a thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was it was through the Lord's dealing with me that some of that got resolved. And you know, so I guess what I, I'm trying to say is that, you know, how is it that we face these trials? And you and I haven't experienced that yet because we're not married yet. We're not. And, and um, I don't think that we've had disagreements at all in, in our courtship here. Not really. Yeah. And, you know, that brings up a word that I want to talk about. But let's talk about that word courtship when we come back from the break, because I think that in and of itself kind of begins to define the way in which you desire to go. I think you're right. Okay. Well, friends, you're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Bankovic. I'm here with my guest today, my fiance, Jack Williams. We're talking a little bit about marriage, a whole lot about marriage, as a matter of fact. And we're going to be sharing with you a little bit about our own journey uh, to the uh altar that will be coming up (laughs) in the not too distant future as a matter of fact Uh, so we hope that you'll return after the break until then god be with you hello ladies johnette benkovic here do you feel called to be a leader to transform the world to deepen your faith why not then accept my invitation to explore the new partnership between the women of grace benedicta leadership institute and holy apostles college and seminary all sorts of dynamic enriching educational opportunities are yours from auditing courses to certification to full graduate degrees in pastoral studies all with a focus on catholic women's leadership for more details go to benedicta.womenofgrace.com that's benedicta.womenofgrace.com February 20th, Julian of Norwich said this about God. He did not say, you will not be troubled, you will not be tempted, you will not be distressed, but he said, you will not be overcome. 
Let us reflect. Dear Lord, so often I feel all but swallowed up by the events of everyday life, not to mention those difficult moments of struggle, confusion, or doubt. It is your grace and your grace alone that gets me through these moments. Help me to remember that in the midst of every circumstance, you are there. In the midst of every reversal, you are there. In my deepest pain, in my worst distress, in my greatest temptation, you are there. Help me to hold on to this truth, and in you, I will overcome. Amen. If you'd like to receive a daily grace line by email, go to womenofgrace.com and click on the word grace line. Then click on the box receive grace lines. That's womenofgrace.com. The wisdom of Mother Angelica. You remember the time I sent on the air? Go to confession. And when you're done, go out and have a big ice cream soda. Celebrate. And a man wrote to me, he says, you know, I hadn't gone to confession in 30 years. Do you mind if I went and had a pizza? <laughs> I said, oh, have 20 pizzas. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. This is Raymond Arroyo, host of The World Over. This is Doug Keck, EW10 President and Chief Operating Officer. Lenten blessings from all of us at the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic. Happy to be with you today. Having a holy conversation today with Jack Williams. He is the general manager of EWTN Radio, the host of Open Line that you hear Monday through Friday right here, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Certainly do hope that you keep your radio tuned always to EWTN. We are with you today for a little special feature here. I know that we're out there uh, present to our people on YouTube, so um, I'm thinking that it's a delight to have you with us today. There, Jack is waving to you. I'm waving to you, too. Always so much fun to be able to have so many different people you know, joining you, us. This is awkward for me. Cause Why, you're, honey? Because you're in my chair. Oh, I am. Yeah, you see, I'm sitting in the host chair, and this is where you sit. Yeah. How about that? So it's a little, it's a little awkward for me. Is it really? And well, I we could have switched. And I can't see Jeff Burson, nice person. Right, but he. I'm receiving the signals today, yeah, so... I'm commandeering the I'm ship. Just, I'm, just a little un, I'm, just, I'm just a little uneasy, that's all. <laughs> well, you don't look uneasy, and that's a good thing. You know what? We've got, uh, actually, we've got Grace out here on Facebook, so we've got some questions coming in. So do you want to take a question or sure, go on I'd a courtship? Sure, happy to. Okay, let's do that. Grace says, my husband and I are married 36 years. Yes, there are seasons and sacrifice, which is not in a lot of couples' vocabulary anymore. And she's absolutely right. And we were talking about that uh, prior to going to the break, that w- we have to go into marriage with our eyes wide open. I'm not saying I did that at 23 years of age. I was actually 22, 10 days short of my 23rd birthday. But the fact is, I don't think that we recognize that unless we're good observers of marriages that have worked. And in my case, you know, I, I witnessed my mom and dad having discussions, as they would say. <laughs> we're not arguing. We're having a discussion. Uh, although the voices could be raised a little bit more than normal. (laughs) Uh, But I also saw that work out. So you take that with you. Uh, but today, as, as uh, Grace points out, uh, this, this idea of seasons in marriage, this idea of uh, uh, working through and sacrificing, not commonly discussed. Uh, most people just see, uh, it's tried to say it, the Hollywood version. But as you so rightly said, Jack, uh, it, it's based on emotion. It's a sentiment. It's, it's a passion as opposed to a decision that says, hey, I'm in this for life. That's exactly right. And, you know, and, and it really leads back to the whole notion of how do you enter into these situations. Right. And, you know, we talked about courtship a little bit before the, the beginning of the break. And one of our evangelical brothers, who is a, a pastor of a, of a kind of a mega church and has sort of a, a, a little bit of a, of a te- television and radio ministry out there in, the, in one sector of, of the evangelical world, I remember him once telling a story about having rules for dating in his household for the mm-hmm. children. And that, first of all, there was no dating of any kind whatsoever until you were 16. And even when you were 16, if you had any notion of wanting to 
have any sort of a social outing with a member of the opposite sex, that was not going to happen until he met that person. Mm -hmm. So his oldest daughter uh, wanted to go to a dance uh, with a group of people, and that was the other rule is that you had to go in a group, right? And so the rule was that this young man would have to come and meet him, and so she knew that. So she told him she wanted to go to this. She said, are you prepared to have him come and talk to me? She said, I am. He said, okay. And I don't know what her name was. We'll say it's Sarah just for the sake of conversation. conversation. So uh, Jimmy rides his bicycle over to this gentleman's office, and he comes in to speak with him about Sarah. And he sits him down on the couch in his office there, and he says, Jimmy, um, I'm very fond of Sarah. You know, she, she's probably my second favorite girl on the planet behind her mother. And I'm guessing that you're pretty fond of her, too, or you wouldn't go through this ordeal of coming to speak with me, right? <laughs> now, I just want to point out a couple of things to you, Jimmy, before this evening commences. Now, as you are probably aware chances are really good if you look at the way our society is set up and how things are in America today there's a really good chance probably that one of these days Sarah is going to get married chances are fairly good that that's probably going to happen now Jimmy chances are even greater that it's not going to be to you. (laughs) (laughs) Talk about shattering the kid's hopes right (laughs) Right at the outset, right? (laughs) So he said, Jimmy, I know, I know, Jimmy, that I can count on you to not do anything during this outing that you would have any level of discomfort explaining to Sarah's future husband. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what a wonderful discussion to have. And I love the way he posed all of that in the positive, yeah. affirming the young man as he's, you know, kind of like just really laying the law down. Well, it was interesting because it made he, he told the story at dinner. And her younger brother, it made an impression on him. And he said that after dinner was over, his son came to him and said, you know what, Dad? I hope someday that I meet a girl whose dad thinks so much of her that he would have that conversation with me. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. And this speaks to um, sort of a methodology, if you will, of building a relationship that's lost on really our culture today. Yes. You know, yes. and, and it comes back to we often speak about what why is there marriage? Even if, even if you take the religiosity out of it, it's there for the procurement and raising of children, mm-hmm. you know. And so there are certain things that uh, need to be given far more consideration than they are in our culture. Mm-hmm. You know, this isn't. Is this someone that you want to hang out with? Or is this, you know, we're not we're not shopping for a friend. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not looking for, you know, a lifelong sexual encounter. These are not the things that we should be looking for. Sadly, they are the things that many of us are looking for, and that's why we find ourselves in the situation that we're in. Mm-hmm. But really, the purpose of a relationship between a mature woman and a mature man should be to discern God's will in their life, as it should be with all things, Mm -hmm. and to discern in that relationship whether or not this is a relationship that he intends to make a sacramental covenant. Right, right. And and that's the way that we approach this relationship that God was entrusting to us. And uh, and that is what you proposed to me the first time you shared with me your feelings. Yes. And you asked if you know, I would accept your invitation to be courted by you, <laughs> which I just found absolutely irresistible, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and and so why don't you share with everybody about, about that? Well, you know, essentially I just, uh, 
I mean, I, 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 I laid out my feelings on the matter, which were very similar to what I've just told you now. And I, and I said that we really, I felt, from my perspective, had a, had a responsibility before our Lord that if we ever, either of us, independent of the other, felt that this was not leading to the altar, mm -hmm. then this sort of a quote-unquote dating relationship would not be an appropriate one. It w right. And that our relationship on that level needed to be over with immediately. Mm -hmm. If either one of us ever felt that that was not where this was leading. Yeah, now, exactly. Now, thanks be to God, neither one of us has gotten to that place. Well, and we're not quite to the to contrary, <laughs> we've kind of gone further down the road of, of what we think our Lord has in store for us. Yeah, absolutely. And and it was beautiful to me because, um, you know, when, when you made that uh, uh, beautiful proclamation of your feelings to me, uh, obviously we had been communicating with each other at a level where it was a good time for you to say that. We hadn't really been in each other's company uh, outside of a professional setting right. at that point in time. So there was, had been a lot of communication uh, between us, however, and a lot of, uh, I think, um, beautiful, deep sharings about our relationship with our Lord and how we looked at different things together. And uh, when you made that statement to me, um, well, you took my breath away, which I told you on the phone. And I said, just give me a minute. <laughs> I have to get my breath back here. You know, but I felt like um, I knew that the Holy Spirit was was prevailing. And I knew that I had a responsibility to respond to that. And I felt that since the Holy Spirit was making his presence known to me interiorly, as I captured my breath in, in the nanoseconds before I spoke, um, I gave the response that Our Lady gave. I said, fiat, you know, I think that this deserves to be explored. Let's see where this goes. And, and that's how we began. And we did something else as well uh, shortly after that. It, once you heard me say yes to your uh, beautiful invitation to court, um, you wanted to start it on that footing that would be one where we would have... Uh, the best opportunity to see if this would take us to the altar. And that was through joining together in prayer. And I think that uh, when we come back from our break, let's talk a little bit about that, the way that you set that up, uh, but, but also why it's important. And, you know, I think that this is the way in which we want to try to bring our children up to look at the possibility of marriage, to begin to talk with them about these kinds of realities. Uh, because if we do that, then we stand a better chance of safeguarding them um, from the interpretation of marriage that the world wants to evangelize them towards. And we also stand a very good chance of helping them gain that sure footing in the Lord that is so necessary for a lifelong commitment. We're going to be right back with Women of Grace. Stay with us. Trump administration rolls back the Health and Human Services contraceptive mandate. U.S. bishops calling for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Pope Francis offers prayers for the victims of the California wildfires. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed a bill banning abortions after 20 weeks. And Pope Francis says the death penalty is contrary to the gospel. Your link to news headlines Catholics count on at the top of the hour. Weekdays on EWTN Radio. This is a Lenten journey with Timothy Cardinal Dolan on EWTN Radio. I had the beautiful celebration of the 50th anniversary of a wonderful married couple and I asked them the secret to their marriage. And they said, well, we uh, vowed to one another and to God on our wedding day that we wouldn't go to sleep at night without saying together the Our Father. And that's what's kept us together. And he said, even when I'm on the road and I got to travel a lot, I'll, I'll always call her and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together before we both go to bed. Uh, Jesus teaches us 
the Our Father in this gospel for the Tuesday of the first week of Lent. Uh, we can't go wrong in saying it. It comes right from his lips. So whenever, whenever there's problem, whenever we say, I don't know what to say to God, we can never, ever go wrong with that Our Father because the Master himself gave it to us. A Lenten Journey with Timothy Cardinal Dolan is available on DVD through the EWTN Religious Catalog. This DVD includes all 47 segments for each day of Lent, from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. To get your copy, log on to our website, EWTNReligiousCatalog.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hi, this is Dr. David Anders. Do you have questions about the Catholic faith? Get the answers on Call to Communion. Join us at 2 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio. Now, back to Women of Grace. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace. I am Janet Benkovic. It is a pleasure to be with you. And I have the uh, awesome privilege and joy of uh, being present to you with my fiance, Mr. Jack Williams, General Manager of EWTN Radio and host of Open Line, heard Monday through Friday right here on EWTN Radio and all of the affiliates that bring you EWTN Radio and all of the partners that work with us in this endeavor. Uh, it is at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you know, we're going to get back to our discussion, but this really leads us into it, Jack, and it's a comment made by Elias, who is with us right now on Facebook. And by the way, if you happen to be out there on Facebook right now or YouTube, EWTN Radio's Facebook uh, uh, opportunity there or the uh, YouTube channel, we invite you to send in questions if you have them. I'm always happy to receive your questions, comments, insights, inspirations, words of encouragement as we have holy conversation together. Elias says this, Jack, marriage is a vocation leading each spouse to holiness of life. Thank you. Uh, and, and so that's the, thank you for your word of encouragement there, Elias. And, and thank you for letting us know that that struck a chord with you. And that leads beautifully into what we were talking about, Jack, when we went to the break. And we shared with everyone that, you know, we didn't date we courted, and the idea was we were courting with an intentionality, which is what courting is, to see if, in fact, God was calling us to be together in a sacramental relationship, the sacrament of matrimony, and that either one of us, uh, you determined at the beginning, should we feel as though it wasn't going to go in that direction, that we would be free to say so, and that we would we would change the nature of, of our activity. Uh, we wouldn't be seeing would, each we other. Would, we would we wouldn't need be, to. We would need to, because because there would be no purpose in moving forward in the relationship. So uh, that didn't happen, however. And it, in the very moment that you made that beautiful invitation to me, you also suggested that we do something that I think really works well with what Elias is saying. We wanted to start this off in a manner that was leaving us open to the working of the Holy Spirit through the maternal beatitude and intercession of our Blessed Lady, so that we might begin to see if this was the path God was going to use to take us to salvation, the distance, right? And so um, share with everybody your, your plan. You had well, a plan. You know, we you had called. so many, uh, we had so many just uh, glorious confirmations from our Lord and our Lady throughout this whole journey. And during the, the you know, I don't know if you want to call it the pre-discernment phase <laughs> of our of our relationship. <laughs> you know, before we sort of made our our intentions known to to one another. You know, we had e we had even at that stage began to pray together. Right, we had and and had even you know you you know before I get any further down the road, you know even you know and, and our Lord had really you know created a, a an atmosphere of prayer for us as we yielded to the promptings of the spirit um, that were so um, intimate that it made you a little uncomfortable. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I have to admit that. Yeah, this was, this was uh, really uh, early on, but uh, there was a, a, a depth to the prayer that we prayed and it was spontaneous prayer. You know, we, we would sometimes have a formula prayer that was added in there. You know, one of our vocal prayers, uh, our father, hail Mary, glory be, um, but when we prayed from the heart with each other, there was a depth to that that I had never really experienced before. And it touched something so deeply inside of me that I felt as though, and I felt as though our, our hearts 
and our souls were being united. Uh, and it was, a, it was a profoundly deep union, and it was one that, that uh, was taking me in, into prayer in a certain way deeper than I had ever gone before. And I wondered because of, of the, the, the response interiorly that I was receiving if this kind of prayer wouldn't be more appropriate after vows were made, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> as it's the only way to express it, you know, and I, and I shared that concern with you, yes. you know, and uh, uh, subsequently I shared it also with my uh, spiritual director and Father Wade Menezes, who has been our spiritual advisor through this process. And, and uh, you know, they said, no, this is, this is not a bad thing. <laughs> this is a good thing. So it was, it was very beautiful. And I think that we began to realize that something was going on. But here. in that process, early on, Our Lady of Sorrows played a key role yeah, she for did. us. And uh, um, so not coincidentally, um, when we had this conversation, it was on a Sunday evening. Yes. And it gave us a wonderful opportunity that if we were to start a novena on Tuesday, the, the day after the next day, yes, um, it would end on the vigil of the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Mm -hmm. So we made a novena for our discernment process to sort of ki officially kick off our discernment process yeah. to Our Lady under that title. And then we're able to um, attend Mass. You were at the National Women of Grace event when the novena ended in mm -hmm. New Mexico. I was. And actually ended up spending a little more time in New Mexico <laughs> than you planned on because of uh, Hurricane, Hurricane Irma. Irma. Yeah, otherwise I would have been home for that evening. Right. But no, I wasn't. But we were able to, actually we were able to attend Mass, the Vigil Mass of the Feast, at the same time. Yeah, that was that was fun. <laughs> this, this is, friends, this is one of the ways the Holy Spirit was showing us that he was really at work because you, I was in, well, I was in mountain time and you were in central time. Usually I'm in eastern time and he's in central time. So I'm usually ahead of him time-wise, but you were ahead of me. Right. And so you were going to Mass at 7 p.m., and it was, I forget, work out the and time for me. It was 8 p.m. for you or something, something, like, something that, like that. No, no, no. I, you were later. I was earlier. You were going at 6 and I was going to 7. That's how. No. So, I don't know. <laughs> we were there, at the, we were there at the same time. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> so we were united in spirit. But you know what? I, you know, just a little correction um, for us on our timing. It was during the prayer of that novena that those, the, those intimations in my heart were so deep. So Our Lady was operative there. Oh, and I, can I tell her about Chamayo? Sure. Those of you that are listening out in New Mexico and in those parts, or those of you that have visited New Mexico, will be familiar with Chamayo. It's a holy place, and they have there something called holy dirt. There's been many miracles that have occurred there. And because we, I was sequestered there with two of my staff, couldn't get back to Florida because of Irma. And so we decided we were going to make lemonade out of, out of a lemon, and we were going to do as much as we possibly could in the area. So we went to Chamayo. And so... One of the, I had, a, I had this little list of criteria. Do you mind me telling them about this? All. Okay. So I had this little list of criteria, uh, you know, that if the Lord was ever going to bring a, a, another man into my life to marry, this person would have to meet this list of criteria. And because I really wanted to make sure it was the Lord's will, you know, because, you know, anyway, I just, I wanted to make sure that this wasn't coming from me, uh, you know, and I wanted to make sure that this was the person for me. So the very first one on the list was a really big one, really big. I said, Father God, if you ever want me to get married again, this man is going to have to come and, and your mother is going to have to be on one side and your, or our lady's going to have to be on one side and your son is going to have to be on the other side. And I said, I'm not asking for an apparition, mind you. But it's got to be some discernible sign. And so the first sign that came was prior to you uh, making that, that little beautiful invitation to court uh, was that my daughter was experiencing Harvey prior to That's Irma. Right. And you knew I was concerned about that. And you said you were going to go make a holy hour. And when you got there, you took a picture of our Lord exposed in the Blessed Sacrament and you sent it to me. And as soon as I got that in my email box, I said, oh! Jesus showed up. 
<laughs> Jesus is on one side of him. And I'm looking all through this picture. I'm trying to expand it. You know, where's Our Lady? Where's Our Lady? She's not there. Well, I subsequently the next day decided that, you know, I was going to go out and try to find one of those places where they've got a, a webcam in, in the Adoration Chapel so that I could be present to the Blessed Sacrament. I don't have that opportunity in my diocese on a, on a daily basis. So I found this website. Here it was the very same church. It was the very same image that you had sent to me. And I called it up the second day, and the second day it was Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic Church. And it was like, oh, there's our mother, right? So when I was in Chimayo, the reason why that's important, t- taking you right into the details here, uh, th- there's this um, outdoor pavilion that has these niches in it where they've got statues to a variety of different saints. And so I'm walking through and I'm saying a prayer to each of these saints just as I'm strolling. It's not any kind of deep prayer. And I walk past this one image and I said, oh, there's Our Lady of Sorrows. And I walk and I said, oh, wait a minute. You can't walk past this. It's Our Lady of Sorrows. So I back up and I notice that there's a statue of our Lord right beside her. And I said, oh, look, it's Our Lady and Our Lord together. Oh, this is another sign from God. But here's the clincher. And this is so good. So I said, oh, surely I must kneel down at this niche and I must pray. <laughs> <laughs> and I kneel down at this niche, and I begin to pray. And in these niches, there's there's healing that happens there, as I mentioned. So people have pictures of their loved ones up there, or people that they know that need prayer, and it plasters the the, the walls of, of these little niches. So I kneel down there, and I look at Our Lady of Sorrows, and I begin to pray. For whatever reason, I turn to my right, and who do you think is there in picture form on the wall somebody had hung her picture (laughs) right in my field of vision i mean it had been there probably for a long long time i look it's mother angelica (laughs) 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 i was just i was weeping (laughs) i was just absolutely weeping because we had been asking for mother's intercession right so i thought oh my goodness this (laughs) this is the trifecta (laughs) I have Our Lady, I've got Our Lord, and I have Mother A. (laughs) (laughs) So those are the little signs. I'm sorry that took a long time to tell, but it's such a precious story. It is. It it is, without question. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was really, and so uh, we we performed that novena. As you mentioned, you know, you were in uh, New Mexico, and I was here in Birmingham as we finished that novena. Yeah. And then the first time that we were physically together, mm-hmm. which would have been the next time you came in to do television here mm-hmm. at the network, yeah. after that, uh, I picked you up at the airport. Yes, you did. And the first stop we made was to the Adoration Chapel at Our Lady of Sorrows Church Yes, uh, to visit our Lord in the Most Blessed Sacrament. And really, I think that the beauty of this whole work that our Lord has been about uh, with us has been the fact that it has has really revolved around him uh, and prayer has been the cornerstone of everything that we've been about you know since we've been going through this what was first a discernment process and is now a preparation for the sacrament yes yes and uh, we've we've um We've had the opportunity on numbers of occasions to uh, just reflect upon the way in which the Lord's moved through that time of prayer. And I think that these are the things that, that, that you know, start a, a solid foundation. And I, and I do want to say this. You know, you mentioned about Susie that you and she didn't start off necessarily on the same path in the early days of your dating and uh, marriage. And, and it was the same for Anthony and I. We were both cradle Catholics. We had fallen away from the faith, though, and we were matrimonied in the church, but we didn't begin to practice our faith right away after that. It took almost, oh, well, it took quite a while, actually, um, about eight years. But, um, you know, we, we learn, and it's never too late, is it, honey? It's never too late for people to uh, begin anew. And, and I think that that's, that's the good news. Look at me shaking my head no on radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late, yes, no. <laughs> but the people out there on Facebook and YouTube can see you. And, and with, Robbie says something here that's kind of sad, and he's with us on YouTube. He says he, says he likes uh, courting compared to dating. In other words, he would prefer to court. He says, but sadly, you know, many uh, of the girls today, many women don't agree. And, uh, you know, I find that kind of, Amazing, really, that they would rather just be- become part of that that cycle rather than 
have an intentionality towards what it is that they're doing. Well, I agree. And it's, you know, in, in reflecting on why this has been such a cornerstone or why the fact that this has been the cornerstone of our relationship has made things so strong for us. Mm -hmm. And I think it lies in the fact that if your primary focus is on our Lord, mm -hmm. then you are oriented away from yourself naturally. Oh, that's beautiful. That's, and so hey, that's it, really good. And so it makes it easier for me to think about something other than myself when that's the practice that I've gotten into, mm -hmm. when that's the habit that I've developed with respect to our relationship is looking somewhere other than myself first. It makes it all that easier to look to another something else other than myself, namely you, mm -hmm. first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I never really thought of that correlation until you just mentioned it. But that that's really beautiful, Jack. I, I'm going to take that into my time of prayer because I think that that's, uh, you know, th that's a key thing. So if I, if I were to take what you've just said and extrapolate it out a bit, the best preparation that we can make for marriage, even before we meet someone, preferably long before that happens, is that we begin a very serious relationship with our Lord and we begin a very active prayer life, right? I agree. You know, I agree. And, and you know, I really hadn't, you know, you and I have talked about this. Neither one of us were really looking for this or any other relationship, mm -hmm. really. You know, mostly for myself, I can't speak for you, but mostly for myself is I was fairly confident that I wouldn't, couldn't possibly have the capacity to love like that mm -hmm. uh, again. Mm-hmm. But as you said, to start that relationship with our Lord, you know, I, I did always kind of know one thing. I didn't have quite the list of criteria that <laughs> you had, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I always did know that, that the thing that I admired the most about Susie in the final analysis, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not the day I met her and maybe not the day we got married, but in the final analysis, I was fairly confident that she loved our Lord more than she loved me. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that's a trait that would have to be duplicated if anything like that were ever going to happen for me again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, when you love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, um, then you are able to love the other with that love. Um, he purifies your natural capacity to love. And so it brings a quality to that, uh, to that uh, interaction with someone else that is not there without that. And so that's beautiful. And, you know, I, uh, and, and, you know, I think that um, I'm very grateful to Susie, you know, uh, because, and I never had, I never had the, the, uh, blessing of meeting Susie, you know, I didn't, uh, and you never met my husband, Anthony either, but you knew of him right. through one little occurrence at one point in time, you might've even heard him. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, I'm grateful to Susie because, you know, she, uh, gifted you in so many ways, I think through, uh, the gift of herself, you know, and that's, enabled you to gift me so much and you do and uh you know i i look forward to this beautiful life that we're going to spend together <laughs> here i'm getting all gushy on on radio but it's very true and you know and i think that that's it you know i think that when you look at the other as a gift then you have the capacity to find the treasure that's there yes you know, and and it doesn't mean that you know we, we've we've not disagreed yet. We haven't had a discussion, a serious discussion about something that you know we see things differently about. We will have those, I'm sure, in the future. But we'll remember that each other is gift, right? That that is my intention. Yes, my intention too. <laughs> that is my pledge to you that we will try to maintain that uh, that perspective. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I told you from the very beginning, you know, that my intention was to be St. Joseph to you. Yes, you did. And how would St. Joseph react to those situations? Right. That was so beautiful. And that was another little confirmation because you shared that with me the night that you uh, invited me 
to, to into a courting relationship. And as he was saying that, the funny thing was, as, as you were saying all of that, um, you had already talked about the courting, and then, and then you shared that. And I was looking smack dab at this beautiful uh, statue plaque of St. Joseph holding the child Jesus. It was directly in front of me as I was sitting on my couch in the living room. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, this is really amazing. Uh, and that speaks of, of sacrifice, you know, and we've talked about that. We, we know what that is because we lived through two very difficult deaths, yours with Susie's death and, and my experience with Anthony's Physically. Death. Physically. Corporally mm-hmm. difficult. Mm-hmm. Spiritually glorious. Yes, Each of them. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had the privilege of witnessing happy deaths, yes. deaths in the Lord, and what a difference that makes to the recollection of that moment. Um, and I think what a blessing it gives us as we go forward in time. I couldn't agree yeah. with you more. Right. So right now what we're doing, friends, just to tell you, is we're, we're preparing for our wedding day. It's May 25th. It's not terribly far in the future. We would appreciate all of your prayers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pray for us as we go through the planning and the preparation. Uh, and pray for us specifically that the planning and the preparation doesn't crowd out, which hopefully we'll call each other on if it begins to do that. Uh, you know, it doesn't crowd out what we're really preparing for, a life of union together until death us do part. And that prayer remain the cornerstone Amen. of what we experience in these upcoming weeks and upcoming months, you know. Uh, not too many of them at this point in time, Jack. Just saying. Got lots of talking to do. <laughs> <laughs> I am a slave to the checklist. <laughs> it's true. Um, we have a, a beautiful uh, uh, statement here from Gabby. And she says, I want to thank you for your witness. Your example of prayer and discernment is an inspiration. Too many couples settle, but you put the Lord first. That is true. We, we, we've, we've struggled we to do that. And we were rewarded for it. And we've been rewarded for it. Uh, we, we haven't done everything, you know, perfectly. There's been times when we, we, you know, should have prayed and, you know, the time slipped away and things like that. But we've always come back to that, right? That's right. And, and why don't you, we've just got about, what, a minute left? We've got a minute. Just share with them that one spiritual uh, gift that Father Wade talks about that every couple should have, their list of things to do, the 14 lists of things for your spiritual life that we employed very early on. Make a morning offering together. Mm-hmm. That's right. So we wrote a morning offering. We did. And sometimes we forget it until like midday or later. <laughs> it becomes our daily offering at that point. <laughs> but we try to get it in there, and those, those are the kinds of things. Well, just a, an absolute blessing and pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, just great fun for Jack and I to have this time to share with you a little bit more about our story. I want to thank you, Mr. Jack Williams, for being my guest today on Women of Grace. Well, I am very grateful for the opportunity. Well, thank you very, very much. And we do want to remind you that you can get copies of this talk uh, right out there via EWTN's religious catalog. You can listen to it on podcasts. If you haven't downloaded the EWTN app, you certainly want to do that. Download that EWTN app because all kinds of good things are archived there for you. You can listen live that way and you can listen to podcasts. You can watch television there too. I'm telling you, it's just terrific. Well, it's been great being with you. Do pray for us. We're praying for you. We remember you in our prayer to every day together until we have the opportunity to be together again. May God richly bless you. Bye-bye.